You may want to rewind. Okay. <laughs> If 
I want to measure a current that potentially can be when it's large, I can put a small resistor there and look at the voltage across that resistor. Right? So one way to do that is put a resistor here, for instance, if I'm worried about that current. Okay? If I put a resistor here, then I have to measure the voltage across this resistor. How do you measure the voltage across this resistor? Transistors are actually normally off. They're 
only turned on when you want to achieve some additional function, functionality. Now, let's go back to the main R path and look at, make an observation. Now, my gain in the first stage is determined by the GM of this guy and the impedance on that node. And in the second stage is determined by the gain of this GM of this PMP transistor and the total capacitance on that node. Now, ideally, in an op hat, as we'll see later on, um, you'll have to accept this as a, uh, in an ax axiomatic form for now. We'll, I'll show you the reason for it later, next quarter. You, your, the gain of an op hat, the gain bandwidth product of an op hat, of a properly compensated op hat, or basically a stabilized op hat, is determined by its first non dominant pole, or in other words, the second largest dynamic, second most significant dynamics in the circuit, not the first one. And because of that, you prefer to get this second gain stage, where you get most of your gain typically, to have the least amount of parasitic capacitance per gain. Okay. Again, I'm giving you the, I'm making a statement here, but we'll see that next quarter why that's the case. Now, because of that, I prefer, I prefer not to get my GM out of a PMP, which is an inferior device. Yeah. I want to have an NPN drive yeah, for the second gain stage. So how would I do that if I were to do something like this? How would we make this an NPN drive on the other? Any thoughts? Can I make this an NPN drive? Yes. Why, why do you want an NPN? Well, I told you kind of it's a, an axiomatic thing. I mean, it's because of the frequency stability of the response. That, that would be preferred to have that as an NPN drive. Because NPNs give you less parasitics uh -oh. per drive uh, in that, at that point. Because basically, this is an uncompensated op -hand. So it's not the way it is, it actually can become unstable under certain amounts of feedback. So if you apply too much feedback to it, or try to use it in unity feedback arrangement, this can oscillate. This oscillate can oscillate. What if we put a capacitor there? Just yeah, yeah, no, no, we are not talking about capacitors yet. We'll do that next quarter. Yeah. That's compensation, that frequency compensation. We'll put a capacitor here to compensate frequency. I mean, that's the middle of compensation. But we'll talk about it later. I don't, I don't want you to worry about that. Yet. We'll come back to this off-hand uh, core. But for now, just believe me that you want to have an N you prefer to have an NPN stage, gain stage here. How would you do that? Not as much in the first stage. I, mean, I don't care as, as much about the input drive. Because the input drive actually is run, running at a much lower current level anyway. If you think about it, because of the input. So, if I tell you that I don't care if this is an NPN, but I do care if this is an NPN, what would you do? Yeah, exactly. Flip the whole thing. That's a good way of thinking about it. Flip it upside down in a way, in your mind, and of course turn all the NPNs to PMPs and all the PMPs to NPNs. Convert, right? For making a complementary structure. So you can always take a complement, they say you can make a complementary variation. Now, why we are doing the complementary one? Why, why don't we do this? Why don't we also make it a higher gain stage too, right? So let's let's use a Casco the input, for instance. So why we are adding this to two higher gains? I can make exactly the complement of that, but since I don't want to redraw it one more time, just let's make make it Casco. So I, what I need at the input, I will have. So this is the VCC. This is the bias, and I'll replace it with the transistor. So now I need a differential pair. That's a PMP pair. Right? And I want to make it casco. So this is something bias that I need to generate. And then I need to make a casco current mirror.
right? And this is my output. And these are my differential V plus V minus inputs. You see how that's the complement of that, of course, it's the complement of the cascode version of the input stage. Now, I need to take this through buffer stages to the next stage, right? But I have to first see what the VD level is. So, what is the VD level? Here. So, if this is minus VCC, the voltage level, what is minus VCC, what is the DC level of this node? But it's this, then the input is balanced. 2VB above this minus VCC. So I show it as plus 2. Okay? You know what that means. Now, my next stage, I want it to be an NTN. So I know an NTN stage. Just for now, let's assume it's simple. It's not a cascode stage. And it has a current source drive, which I know is a transistor. So I need to get to a plus one. Okay? And I need to also maintain a high impedance. So one way to do that is what we want buffer stage, right? If I have one basically like let's say an NPN buffer stage like that, I go from plus two to plus one. But would that be enough to get a high enough impedance at the input? Well think about it. If this is at one milliamp ballpark. Right? This is 2.5 kilo ohms or pi. Right? Times beta is 250 kilo ohms. What are these output resistances? Well, looking up, you see RO, beta ROP, beta P ROP. And looking down, you see beta N RON over 2. Right? There. So, what are the values? Beta ROP. Well, it depends on the current. So let's say I keep the current the same so the input impedance is maintained, right? So this is 50 microamps per stage. So for 50 microamps, I got an ROP of 1 mega ohm. So times 50, this is 50 mega ohms. And RON uh, was 2 mega ohms times, divided by 2 is 1 mega ohms times 100, so that's 100 mega ohms. What is this input? It says for 2.5 times 100, so this was 250 kilo ohms. Way off. Right? So I need more buffer stages in between. Well, how many more? Can I put one more? I, I can't, well, I, I, if I put one more, the DC levels cannot be fixed. Right? Because it would add or subtract one dB and I can't do it right. So I have to go up and down one more time. So what I can do, I can go up and come down. So I can use an, an NPN, a PMP, and an NPN. So I use something like this. So I use an NPN. And then I go to a PNP. And then go to another NPN. And I go here. Right? So let's see if this works out. So this is plus two. This is plus one, this is plus two, this is plus one, and this is plus one. So I'm okay. Right. Now how about the impedance I see? Well, now I know this is going to be 250 kilo ohms, right? But this is 2.5 kilo ohms times beta is 250 kilo ohms. So that's right there. 2.5 kilo ohms, 250 kilo ohms. What is this? This is that times 50. That's 2.5 times 5, that's 12.5 mega ohms, okay, based on a simple calculation. And then, what is this? That times a beta, so that's 1.2 giga ohms. Okay, but let me ask you another question. Is this calculation correct? No, for a couple of reasons. Tell me the reasons. There's one that's apparent in this schematics. Because of R naught? Yeah, exactly. That's the one. Right? See, because these are the output resistance of a current source, right? And this is not an ideal current source. So here it didn't matter because this is a, let's say if it's running at 1 milliamp, we know from 1 milliamp this is about 100 kilo ohm for an N N NPN and about 50 kilo ohm for PMP. So this doesn't matter, but this is 50 kilo ohm. In parallel, it's 150 kilo ohms. So that's pretty much.
50 kilohertz or even less, right? Say 40 kilohertz, 45 kilohertz. So that's going to be 45 kilohertz times this data of 50. The 50 times 50, that's uh, 2.5 mega ohms, right? But that 2.5 mega ohms is in parallel with the output resistance of this guy, which is what? 100 kilo ohms for an NPN. So that's pretty much 100 kilo ohms. So when I go, go, go up, that becomes again 10 mega ohms. So you can see, I can't go beyond a certain value just because of the output resistance that we worked out. And even if it could quite well, and then you may come back to, well, yeah, that's assuming that you make it out of a simple transistor current source. If you make a task flow, then you can get multiplied by beta, which is true. You could do that. You can make each one of these task flows that it improves. But then again, then you're, if you're talking about things of, on the order of tens and hundreds of mega ohms, then you have to really think about the leakage currents. Other paths for current flow, when you're talking about really high resistance, and that, those may be your limiting factors. So if you actually make something that's 500 mega ohm here or 1 giga ohm here, and then you, speak, you, measure, you expect tremendous gain. And then you make it and it comes back 10, 100 times less, you know what to look for. So, but let's just leave it that. I mean, that's the way it is. Let's say one, 10 mega ohm here, that's good enough. 10 mega ohm, we pair it with 50 mega ohm, we pair it with 100 mega ohm, is about probably 9 mega ohm. 9 mega ohms times GM of this guy, which was 4 millisiemens. So, 4 times 9 is about 36, that's, let's say 35. 35,000. So the gain on the first stage 30, is 35,000. And now the gain on your second stage as is, of course, is the same as before. If you uh, have it something like 1,200, you can, of course, make these cast code and increase that if you really want to. But let's, let's leave it as is. And from this point on, it's almost the same as the other one, except for the fact that it's exactly complementary of architecture. Right? So you go from here, what you need to do, you need to make a PMT follower, and then take that and bring it here, have your diet connected transistors. And then you can drive the push pull like this, and your peak current would be here. Right? And then if you want to put your protection circuitry and all that stuff, you can put them here, there, have a little transistor.
So uh, we're talking about the output swing um, is limited on the output stage by those those limiting factors. But how about um, in the the game the second game stage, right? The DC level is around one BMD on the gate, I mean on the base of that. This one, right? Yeah. So if you have a large game on the first stage, mm -hmm. and that will swing that higher, so it could drive that out of So 
often survives. Okay, um, there are a couple of things we can do now. So I don't think we can finish everything about this offhand discussion today. So what I'd rather do, uh, let's go to your book and look at some real offhand. The next time we'll talk about CMOS offhands. Let's do that. Let's go to your book. Um, any questions on this, please, guys? Yes. Um, is it actually possible to cascode the current stages below the uh, MPN followers between the first and second stages? Since yes, here, even, right? Yeah, would that mess oh, up? Oh, yeah, that would help. That would help with the gain of the first stage. But would it mess up your DC levels? Because you only have you only have one BPB above that. Um. Uh, well, okay, that's a good point. That's a good point. You have to be careful. So, so probably if you want to do that, you have to first go up before you go down. So what you need to do in that case, you need to first put your PFP first. That's a good point. So in that case, you have to swap the order of these two stages. First go up, so you have enough room. And then that one can always be a cascode, right? Because this is reference to minus B. There's plenty of voltage drop here. Now, and then the next one would be an NPM, but you will start off at plus 3. And if you have a plus 3, this would be a plus 2, then you have, you have enough headroom for the cascode current source. So that's a good point. Did I answer your question? Yes. Alright. Okay, so let's go take your book out. Let's go to... Everyone is familiar with 741, right? Have you, has anyone... Has everyone used 741 at some point in their lives? Okay, so... Now, if you go to page, let's, let's start with the, the page 455, figure 630. Okay, so you see, that's pretty much the full blown schematics of the 741. Now, 741 uses a different input stage.
that were from an AC perspective to the ground. Sorry. RM, right. So what you have here is a voltage divider between the RM and an RM. Right, and the input, if you look at the T model for the first transistor, it looks like this. Right, that's the upper transistor. It's the RM, or oh, alpha RM, but what we have. It's VN. And then it goes to RM, and then there's this guy, alpha uh, IE, where this is IE, and this is ground. This goes to whatever node RM I have. It's V out. So I don't even need to kind of look at this. I can separate these. So this voltage, this current, IE, is simply V in over 2RM, right? Which is replicated here in the back of alpha. So the gain of this thing is going to be RL divided by 2RM times alpha, approximately. Right, you see what I'm saying? So there's a voltage divider, you lose half of the voltage there, but that's what you see. So it's a common collector followed by a common base in differential form. So now, the transconductance of the stage, if you think about it as a current output, the transconductance, the capital GM of this whole thing, is going to be basically GM over 2. Right, because that's what over 2 RM. Because we write this as gm over 2 times rl, whatever the rl is. So this is the effective transconductance of this stage. So now, from that perspective, so if you put a differential current, differential voltage here, it turns it into a differential current with this ratio. That differential voltage is multiplied into a differential current by this gm over 2 ratio. And then what it does, so, so that's the input stage, right? So look at it and then basically what that's composed of, q1, q2, q3, q4 in your schematics. Now, Q5, Q6, and Q7 form a current mirror. So Q, between Q5 and Q6, you have that current mirror, right? Q5 is the diode connected one, except for the fact that Q7 is there to make sure that the base current is not going to be a major limitation, right? We talked about this. Now, the current mirror has a little kind of twist to it. The thing is that there are two resistors. We saw that if you put two resistors down there, you can increase the output impedance. The resistors R1 and R2. The one kilohertz, right? So basically, those get multiplied by one plus. That's it. R e of the current source. So that allows you to have a high impedance on the collector of Q four and Q six, which is the output of the first gain stage. Now Q eight. If you look at the Q eight, Q eight is essentially a diode connected transistor, which creates a low impedance on that node, on the upper node. So it makes it into a common collector. Uh, and then Q nine. Is basically a you see between Q look at the left the leftmost branch so you have Q11 and Q12 which is the reference branch you see it's not very fancy actually the reference the current generated in Q741 is not temperature independent or anything it's not exactly the supply independent so what what you see there are two diodes diode connected transistors Q12 and Q11 and the current in that branch is basically v, two VCC well VCC plus VEE right the total voltage across that minus the two VBEs of Q12 and Q11, divided by the 39 kilo. Right? That's the current in that branch. And that comes from reference branch. And it's repli then it uses a wider current mirror using Q10. See, Q10 has a resistor in the emitter that basically scales down the current from that reference branch. And that's copied again. In, well, that goes to Q9 and then copied to Q8. So and that also is used to generate the common mode voltage that you need for the basis of Q3 and Q4. Right? So that, that whole thing, the first stage is pretty much that plus a glorified current mirror. So this is the current mirror. I mean, I show it like this, but it's kind of a better version of that. And then the resistors here. And then, of course, the bias circuitry associated with it. Right? So the first stage, that's the first stage. The gain of Q. Now, you see that the output of that first stage goes to the base of Q16, which is what kind of a stage? Follower. It's a follower, exactly. It's a common collector, right? The collector goes to VCC. So it, what it does, it basically increases the input impedance, the, the impedance seen by the first stage, due to the input of the Q17, which is your next gain transistor. So the Q17 is like this transistor for us, like second gain stage. Q17 
17 is equivalent of that. And Q16 is like that. Except for the fact that instead of biasing with a current source, they decided to bias it with a resistor. Now, Q17 collectors connected the collector of Q13. Now, Q13 looks sort of awkward. It's a double collector. You can think about the two transistors, right? Q16, Q13, you can think about it as two transistors in parallel, which have the same base emitter voltage. So, basically, you are concerned about Q13B at this point. One transistor. So you can see how we have formed a high impedance node there between the collector of Q17 and Q13B. Now that node drives from that point on, so that's the output of that, the collector of Q17 is the node where you have the full swing. So from that point on, you basically have the following circuitry, right? So if you look at that, then look at Q Q23. Q23 is a basic follower, right? It's just another follower. The input is applied to the base, and the output is taken out of the A node. Forget about the B node for a second, right? Forget about the B emitter for a second, we'll come back to it. So just, just pretend that the B input doesn't exist for a second. That's another follower. Now, between Q18 and Q19, you can see that it's kind of like a two diode connected devices, right? There are two diodes. If you look at between these two terminals, the upper end, the collector of Q18 or Q19 and the emitter of Q18, if you go, you go through two VBs, one VB of the Q19 and one VB of Q18. And that resistor is there to maintain the same cur the current levels um, reasonable. And the good thing about it is that if you use that resistor, by modifying that resistor, you can actually fine tune the value of these two VBs. It's called actually a VB multiplier. You can play with the VB value. But because it controls the amount of current that flows into Q19. Right? But essentially it's a 2 VDE drop, which is tunable by that resistor. And now Q13A is a current source. Is it, as I said, I mean, you can think about those two as two different transistors, Q13A and B. And Q13A is another current source, the collector of that PMP, driving that current. And what it does, it basically essentially provides that current, so that's like the bleed current that we had in our stages, right? Is that like, like in this transistor, it's equivalent of this guy, Q13B, Q13A is like that. And basically Q18 and 19 are like these two, the direct connected guys, right? And then Q23 is like this follower, Q23A. This guy. Now, of course, you have the two output transistors, Q14 and Q20, which are the main driver of transistors at the output. And you can see the protection circuitry on there. You see that R6 and Q15 do exactly the same thing as we did here. Right? They protect for overcurrent, they're basically that's overcurrent protection. And then now the, the way they do their uh, protection for the P PMP, the lower one is slightly different. Uh, what they do is that you can look at it and say, well, the collector of the Q21 is mirrored through Q24 and Q22. You see, Q24 is a diode connected device. Right? And Q22 is kind of, that's a mirror. Between Q24 and 22 is a mirror. Right? So that current is mirrored. And then it's, what it does, it just basically lowers the base current of Q16. And when you lower that base current, you basically reduce the gain up front. They basically reduce the gain at an earlier point down on the feedback path. Okay? And, and that's basically also done through the, Q, the B emitter of Q23. So basically, it shuts down a whole bunch of things because those are also, those need to be protected. So that's why it, why it, they do it in a different way. They want to protect other things other than Q22. Q20, Okay, so you, you're, you hopefully have a clear understanding. But now, if you go to page Q uh, page four fifty eight, right? That's somewhat of a, somewhat of a simplified version of this alpha. So again, I didn't want to start from the simplified version of the alpha. This time, I decided to start from the most complicated one because you could see it. But yes, what? Why did they connect the? Source on Q, Q8? Well, the Q, 
uh, if you look at the, Q, that, the picture on the figure 635, right? You see exactly the same thing. So you see that input stage, Q16 being the follower, Q17 the gain, the second gain stage, and then Q23 and the push Q23, which is the follower, and then you have the push pull transistors Q14 and Q22. So that's a simplified version of that, right? And even if you want an even more simplified version of this amplifier, you can look at figure three, 632 on page 456. And that's kind of the most simplified version of what this offhand looks like. So the idea here is that you can see that you can basically start off with something simple. And you add elements and components or modify your elements as you go and as you need. Right? You don't arbitrarily pick a complex topology or something. Now, let's look at some other variations of offhand. So let me see what else we have here for bike growers. And then, then there's a complete analysis of this thing, of this offhand. Uh, but now, let's go to page 475. Now, you know, one of the problems in offhand is the input offset. Because you remember that because of this very large gain, if you have a little kind of offset or mismatch in the input of the transistor, so if your transistors are not matched, even the slightest amount, let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, you have one millivolt, or let's say 100 microvolts of mismatch between the inputs, transistors, right? Well, if you have a gain of a million, that translates to what? That comes, translates to 100 volts at the output. So basically, it means that the state, if you short the input, the state will saturate to one side or the other. So that's the random part of the offset. Now also there's a systematic offset because of this asymmetry that we introduced and we talked about this a little bit before. That because of this asymmetry, there is a little bit of minimum voltage necessary at the input. The DC voltage needs to be maintained at the input to make, to make sure that the output remains at a zero voltage at a kind of a balance point. Now, no matter what the source of offset is, the offset is a problem, right? Because you don't want to have this constant DC, you don't want to be, have to maintain this constant DC at the input. So, there are several ways to deal with that, and one of the deals, one of the kind of older ways of dealing with it, was this trimming idea. So if you look at this figure 648, what you see, you see that the stage, this is a very, very basic uh, differential stage, right? So you have two resistors RC, and now you have smaller resistors R prime, 2R prime, and 4R prime on both sides. It can be either shorted or shorted across or open. So the way they do it, if you want to, like, to be, the most common way is a laser trimming. Initially, they are shorted. So those resistors, those switches, are short. So there's a piece of metal that shorts the two sides of the resistor. But what they do, they measure the input offset, and you can see these are quite rated, and decide what change they need to make in the output resistors to compensate for this offset. And they trim, they cut basically the resistors they need on one side to, to give you that kind of balance. And since they're binary weighted, by cutting the right number of the correct one, can actually add an arbitrary value of the resistor within reason. Now, more modern op yeah, just more modern op actually have to look at other ways. There are more systematic ways of doing offset cancellation, and we'll talk about this actually toward the end of next quarter. There's a systematic way of canceling offset, off offset cancellation. So you can make op you know, op amps and amplifiers that internally measure their own offset and subtract it from the value. And basically, they create a situ you can create a situation that the op amp can compensate its own offset without the need for laser trimming. As you can imagine, this laser trimming is extremely expensive. Because for every single chip, you have to, your tester has to go measure the, the offset in the op amp. Then the laser has to come in and cut these. Now, this whole process may, may take one second per op amp. But if you're setting a million op amp, that you pay for the test for time per second. So it directly adds to the cost of the, the bill of materials, basically. You know, so that's something you want to avoid. And that's why you, you, you might as well spend, you know, put like another 200 transistors in there for offset compensation in your design phase so you don't have to pay that time. And eventually, it makes economical sense to do something like that. You had a question, sorry. Oh, no, I was just wondering. Modern op amps have any self-actuating. Oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah. So, uh, there, there are a lot. I mean, they don't even do it this way. There's a better way of doing it. Most 
talk about that. There's so many ways. There are offset compensation, offset cancellation is a very deep field of research. I mean, a lot of people do all sorts of different kinds of offset compensation, offset cancellation. Offset cancellation. Now, if you go to, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of mismatches in the transistors, right? One of the things we talked about was this common centroid. So if you want to make these two transistors, Two transistors that look more or less the same, one of the ways you can lay them out is basically in the layout you can put four and put two and two in parallel. So an example of that is shown on page 477, the layout example of that, which is a common centroid layout. So when you look at that, you'll see that the transistors are connected in parallel in a cross fashion. So Q2 and Q3 are in parallel, and Q1 and Q4 are in parallel. And you will see that that compensates the first order for variations in the um, transistors. Now, the one last thing before we go today. So, now, one of the problems we have with this op amp, if you think about it, the different, there's a difference between this op amp and the real op amp. Now, in addition to the fact that you have an input offset voltage, and you have, a, you may have also an input offset current, so basically the two input currents may not be the same, you also need an input bias current. Right? In this op amp, if you look at it, there's the base current of those two, two transistors that need to be provided. So is, so is the case in the case of a 741. So both inputs actually pull current in. There's a constant DC current that needs to be maintained. And in some cases that can be a problem, depending on what kind of source load you have and where does this current come from, that can result in some additional error, some additional voltage drop across the voltage that will appear at the input, which is a really bad place for an error to occur. So one question is how do we minimize this current? Is there, is there a simple way to minimize this current. And what the simple answer is yes, of course, if you can somehow provide this current internally, add some additional circuitry that can provide this current, at least at its nominal value, so you don't have to maintain this constant DC current. And an example of that, a simple example of that is shown on page 478, figure 52. So what you see in this case is that in addition to the input connection to the basis, there's this combination on both sides. So let's talk about the left-hand side. So Q1 is the input transistor, right? And Q3 is a cascode. But what's done here is that the current, the base current of the cascode, right, which goes in, is mirrored using a PMP mirror consisting of Q5 and Q6. And that's provided back into the base of Q1. Now, the assumption here is that since Q3 and Q1 have the collective currents that are very similar to each other, within a base, within a pack of alpha of each other, so if you mirror that current and copy back into the input, you can compensate for the bulk of the input base current. So that's provided internally through that pack. And it's done for both sides, as you can see. So the other side, Q7 and Q8 are mirror images of that. So that's a simple trick, for example. There are many, many things that can be done about the offense. I will talk a little bit more about some of the other things that you can do. But, um, so let me stop here and let you ask questions if you have any questions about this. And what we'll do next time, we'll talk about CMOS offense, some of the variations of that, and continue our discussion. So, any questions? Would there be any advantage to using something other than class A, B, amplifier? The output? Yeah, of course. I mean, it depends on what your application is. Sometimes you want to use a class B output. Sometimes you want to use a different... You, sometimes you just want to use a class A, depending on what kind of distortion you're looking for. So, for instance, the example that a friend... I mean, the question he asked early on, right? So, said, well, the gain on the positive side of the... positive half of the cycle and the negative half of the cycle are different. So that translates directly to distortion. And feedback takes care of that to some extent, but the smaller the distortion to begin with, the less you have to compensate for. It also it depends on what kind of application you're designing an output for. Sometimes you don't even have an output stage. Right? If you're driving a capacitive load, for instance, think about it. If your load is not resistant, if you if you're making an on-chip op amp, you may not need a lot of this stuff. Because in, an on-chip op amp drives something else that's on chip. So it's designed for one specific load value. So you don't even need to kind of have this protection circuitry or some of this buffering circuitry, or if it's driving a capacitor, you don't even need the buffer stages. You may be able to get away with just that input stage, the differential pair and the load. That may be just enough for you, depending on what you're trying to do. 
And we'll, in, particularly in CMOS, we'll see some examples of that when we go through the bottom of the um, Now, the point I wanted to take away from this, other than the fact that this was an example of putting together some of the things we've learned about so far, is that if you look at these circuits stand alone, they can look complicated and intimidating. Right? But if you can dissect them, if you can build them up from grounds up, right? If you understand these building blocks, right? I said, like, you, know, you remember earlier on I told you these are like the Lego building blocks that you put together and make something big and interesting? So this is one example of many, many different things you can make with it. But you have to be able to identify this kind of basic, oh yeah, okay, that's it. The French are the pair. Come and learn the French. That's a current mirror. So that's a high impedance note. So that one's a follower. That's another follower. That's another name station because I have a high impedance note there. And so on. So that's a push -ball. So, and the more of these building blocks that you're familiar with and you can identify, the better off you are, and then you will understand more and more. And they, it, learning never stops. So I run into stages that I haven't seen before okay, every so often, and then I kind of say, well, maybe you know, I do a little bit of analysis and kind of read a little bit about it. So, oh, yeah, okay, this is what it does. So, once you understand the basic principles, you can understand these. And as I told you, the, the number of combinations are infinite. Nobody knows all the combinations. That's the beauty of it. That's the difference between design and analysis. Design is a creative task. Of course, it's based on some fundamental understanding of the science behind it, but so you can't arbitrate. If, it's like painting, right? If someone takes a brush and randomly kind of uh, strikes a, uh, uh, most of the times you won't get something interesting. That's Pollock, though. <laughs> hmm? You know, this is the interesting thing. You know, a lot of people think Picasso, if you've seen Picasso paintings, right? right? If you haven't, actually, there's a very good exhibit at Norton Simon, they have a really good collection. Um, now, you look at Picasso paintings, this guy couldn't paint, right? So that's the reaction, I couldn't draw, right? Just, you know, that's your first reaction. I mean, at least one moment, like, what? And it, it's, it's interesting, but you know, it's, it's just the only thing you can do. Of course, they are very interesting, smart, right? If you look at them. But if you look at his early works, he can actually do those kind of basic, you know, realistic things that look exactly like the real thing. So he has this kind of portrait that look like a portrait and not a normal person. So that tells you that the guy could do that and he went one step beyond that, one step behind, beyond that. If I randomly take a kind of a brush and kind of start drawing lines, I won't draw, I don't necessarily, most of the time, won't create some form of art. But that's the point here too. I mean, so you have to understand where it comes from. You have to understand the basics. But it's open-ended. It's like painting. You can have you, you have to develop. If you end up working in this field, you have to develop your own style, and you will develop your own style. And after a while, if you actually become spend a fair amount of time, you can even recognize other people's style, and other people recognize your kind of circuits. So sometimes I can look at circuits and say, well, this must be done by such and such. Or if someone looks at it and says, well, this is a signature kind of a uh, circuit designed by such and such. 